If you're a computer science student taking your first steps into coding, recursion is probably one of the first topics that hit you hard. Not because it's inherently difficult, but because it's one of the first topics that require you to think and reason about so many different things at once. It's just hard to imagine what recursion does, much less design a recursive implementation that works correctly. And the more you are used to procedural programming, the less comfortable you feel. But there are ways to work around this and reasonably wrestle recursion right, even if you're more familiar with the straightforward procedural style. In this video, we'll try to formalize upon the thought processes that are necessary to become proficient at recursion. So let's get started with the basic definitions. What characterizes recursion is its self-referential nature. The most classic example of this is Fibonacci numbers, which refers to a sequence of numbers in which each number is the sum of its two preceding ones. That's why it's self-referential. To figure out the nth Fibonacci number, you first need to know the Fibonacci numbers at the n-1 and n-2 positions. To know those, you've got to trace your way in even further. And yet, self-referential behavior isn't all there is to recursion. If you were to go purely by the definition we've just discussed, you'll never be able to arrive at an answer because you're going to have to keep tracing deeper and deeper without any end in sight. Thus, in addition to a self-referential definition, a base case is also important. That is, one or more specific cases in which, instead of delving further into the recursion, we give off a fixed constant answer, thus breaking the chain. When it comes to the Fibonacci sequence, the base case is actually defined as such. The first two numbers in the sequence are set to 0 and 1, though other definitions exist. Therefore, when the recursion gets around to the first two numbers in the sequence, that's the answer and we don't have to proceed further. So let's try it. Let's do a trace on paper first and then get into the code. What you're seeing up here is the formal mathematical definition of what a Fibonacci number should look like. So all that's left to do is to give this a trace and see just how it behaves. Let's do Fib4. So what we want is the fourth Fibonacci number. And if you were to apply the definition shown up here, that means we need to get the third and the second Fibonacci numbers and add them together. So okay, what is the third Fibonacci number? Again, we do the same thing. We apply the formula and that tells us that the third Fibonacci number is the sum of the second and the first. I'm sure you can see where this is going because to figure out the third Fibonacci number, again, we have to delve into what the second Fibonacci number is. That is the first plus the zeroth. So that's what recursion is. You define a function using the function's own definition. And once you call the function, you start to have to unravel and go in deeper and deeper. Luckily, that always stops somewhere, and in this case, that's right here. Both of these are base cases, right? Because Fib1 is defined as 1, Fib0 is defined as 0, we don't have to go further. These two values give us 1 and 0 respectively, which is great because now, with this, we can find out what is Fib2, and that in turn feeds back to the previous caller. So in this case, the two numbers return to their caller, and what we can do is sum the numbers together, and again, this number can go back to its caller. At the same time, Fib3 also relies on Fib1, but luckily, that is also a base case. We can just take the answer from the definition, and we can be on our way. That finally gives us the answer of 2 for Fib3. But we're not done, are we? We still have another Fib2 to go through. Again, that is a recursive call. Thankfully, this leads us to FIP1 and FIP0. We have the answers 1 and 0. So bring them back. That gives us our answer for FIP2. Finally, we have all the information FIP4 needs to produce its final answer. So that's recursion. And when we start to execute a recursive function, you'll find that this happens. Each function call calls itself some more that could keep on going. And as a result, there is sort of a notion of repetition, but it's not really repetition in the style of a loop. Anyway, let's go ahead and write this out as code just to see it work. So welcome to Thorny. This is an IDE for the Python programming language. We'll jump around between different languages today, but for now, let's stick to Python, which is fairly simple to understand. So 
let's go ahead and write our Fibonacci function. I'm going to try and define it in the same way as we did earlier on. So fib takes in the parameter n. What I'll do is I'll check for the two base cases first. The first base case says that if n is 0, then give the answer of 0. On the other hand, if n has the value of 1, then return the value 1. So these are our two base cases. The moment we hit these cases, it's not recursive. We do not call the fib function anymore, so it doesn't unravel any further. We simply give a constant answer and we are done. So you can see how a base case is important if you want your recursion to actually stop. Let's now write our recursive case. This time, this relies on more calls to the fib function. This time, our answer is based off of fib n minus 1. We want to add that to fib n minus 2. So let's try it. Let's go ahead and call fib4, which is what we just traced through. Run this, and you'll see that the answer is 3, the exact same answer as we've gotten earlier. So that's recursion. You need a recursive case in which your function calls itself, and a base case in which it does not. In terms of definitions, that seems good enough. But when it's time for you to design your own recursion, you probably find it takes time to reason about how everything unravels itself. I'll break these challenges down into two major points. Firstly, how do we design a recursive operation such that it moves from step to step in a way that helps us solve our problem? Then, how do the answers of each intermediate step come together to give us our desired answer? Let's study the first of these two points to start off with, and to do that, let's consider some key observations from our Fibonacci trace. If you look at the parameter n, you realize it is key to everything working together. Firstly, note how n is different from one recursive call to another. Each recursive step can have its own set of local variables, including the parameter n. Knowing that then, notice how n is in fact what is driving the entire operation. n tells us where we are right now in a Fibonacci sequence, and by extension, what our progress is. So it acts very much like the counting variable in a for loop. Notice also that in making our recursive calls, we use n-1 and n-2. In other words, when thinking about each recursive step, we also want to think about preparing our counting variable for the next step. In effect, we're changing n such that we are moving bit by bit towards the base case. While it's now clear how the recursive Fibonacci function gets the job done, how do we chart the path for any recursive function in the most general sense? How do we formulate our recursion such that it starts at the right place, moves in the right way, and ends on our base case? To become proficient at that, practice makes perfect. And while I know that sounds very much like a cop-out of an answer, the good news is there are some simple drills you can use to practice this. The easiest way to start is to convert looping to recursion. Try it. Build a countdown function that counts from 10 to 1, printing each number. Consider the parameter you want to use for your function and what role it plays in keeping track of your progress. Remember your base and recursive cases, and remember that your recursive case must move towards your base case. Go ahead, pause the video if you like, and I'll go through one possible solution after this. So let's try writing this in C just for fun. Let's go ahead and write a countdown function. Our countdown function needs to count through a set of numbers. So it would make a lot of sense to pass in that number as a parameter like this. So I hope you are drawing some parallels between this and what we've been doing in Python earlier on with the Fibonacci numbers. As always, I like to start with my base case. We want to count from whatever number down to one, right? So if it is less than one, if n is equals to zero, or if you want to be safe, if n is less than or equals to zero, then what we'll like to do is we'll like to end the recursive call. In this case, we're not relying on the return values, so I'm just going to return nothing. This is a void function anyway, so that doesn't matter so much. When you say return, it just stops the recursion. It doesn't make another recursive call. Otherwise, what we would like to do is to do a print. When we do a print in C, it looks something like this. We have to tell it we want to print the value of n as so, and then we'll make our recursive call. But this time, we'll use the value n minus 1 instead. That way, the next call gets a smaller value of n, and as our recursion progresses, we will eventually hit our base case. That's the plan. 
So let's go ahead in our main function, let's go ahead and call countdown of 10. That's what we want to do, right? We want to count from 10 all the way to 1. So with our code in place, we can go ahead and compile it like so. No errors, that's good news, and run it. Now what we have is indeed our set of countdown values. Now, there is something interesting to take note of here. While yes, we do count from 10 all the way to 1, do take note that we do actually call countdown 0. We do. When n is 1, that's not the base case. We have to print out the value, and that leads to us calling countdown of 0. Only then does it hit the base case and return, thus ending off the recursion. So compare this to if we wrote this as a loop instead. I'll go ahead and write that here. So I'm going to start with i at 10. For i, i greater than 0, take away 1 from i. And turns out our printf function is exactly the same. So I'm going to be lazy and copy and paste. If you take a look at these two implementations of what is essentially the same code, you will hopefully realize that there is a lot of overlap. We have defined our starting value here. We don't technically need it here. We have our starting value, which is the original parameter we've given to countdown. For a for loop, we say when we want the loop to continue going. But for our recursive function, we instead say when we want it to stop. I hope you can see that these two statements are checking the same boundary, just different sides of the same boundary. Then the value goes down, right? We decrement our value of i, and that's exactly what's happening in our recursion as well. So these two approaches are really analogous, and I hope you can see the correspondence here. Once again, what are the key observations we can make about this approach? Observe how, just like in writing loops, we can only write one step of the computation. You have to take it that some external mechanism is making this step happen repeatedly. There are pros and cons to this. While yes, you have to correctly design one recursive step to lead to another, what's cool is that you don't have to worry about the full program state. Instead, we just write one recursive call while imagining that the function you are calling already exists and is magically correct. I've heard this term as wishful thinking, but whatever you want to call it, the key takeaway here is that you need to have a clear idea of what's supposed to happen. In other words, you think about the full behavior of the program when you design your function. When you actually implement it, all you have to concern yourself with is one arbitrary step and how it leads to the next. So far, so good. Hopefully, you can now see how a parameter can behave like the counting variable in a loop. Now let's try a different drill. So far, we've seen applications of recursion that use an explicit parameter to count our way through the recursion. Sometimes, such a variable doesn't exist. Instead, it's implicit, hidden away elsewhere. One common application is to use recursion over lists. The pattern then is to just handle one item each time and then handing off the rest of the items to a further recursive call. While there is no n, no explicit counting variable this time, it's still there, hidden away as the length of the list. Depending on how you want to approach this, your base case would be when your list runs down to either 1 or 0 items. Let's see this in action. Let's take a list of numbers, double them, and print each number. We are now back in Thorny to attempt to implement this function. So here is how we intend to call it. You have a list, you call list double on the list, and it should give you a doubling of everything inside the list. So let's begin. Let's go ahead and define our list double function. And of course, what it needs to take in as a parameter is the list itself. Again, let's work on a base case. I think the simplest base case you could say is if the list is an empty list, right? So this means it's a list with nothing inside. If it's an empty list, then just return an empty list. That's it, we're done. But if it isn't, so this is our recursive case. If it isn't, then here's what we would like to do. Let's go ahead and extract the first item out of the list. So that will be list position zero. We're going to take that item and we're going to double it, right? That's what we want to do. We want to double each item. Then we want to construct the final answer. The final answer is our first item, which I'm going to put in a list and I'm going to go ahead and say, add it to the rest of the list. And this is where I make my recursive call. And what's interesting is that magically solves the rest of the problem. I mean, I know that 
list double is going to double everything in a list, right? So if I were to just call list double, assuming that it was written correctly, on the rest of the list, then joining these two things together should give me the correct answer. What this means, incidentally, if you're not so familiar with Python, is this gives us everything in the list starting from position 1. So it's basically everything except this guy. So now that we have all this, let's go ahead and run our code. And you can see, for the input 1, 2, 3, 4, we get the answer 2, 4, 6, 8. So what list double actually works with here is the list gets smaller and smaller. Each time we have one less item inside the list as evidenced by this slicing operation here. So every step we go, we get rid of the first item. The list gets smaller and smaller, and it eventually ends up empty. That's the behavior here. What we've done here is an almost functional programming approach to working with lists. Because we're using Python, slicing is an easy and effortless thing to do. So of course, we do it that way. But what if you're using something more traditional, say C? or if you're concerned that such operations are unnecessarily expensive on RAM and computation. Interestingly, what you would do is reintroduce the counting variable n. Instead of passing a different list to each recursive call, we'll pass the same list every time, but use a second parameter to indicate our position within that list. Let's see what that looks like. For this implementation, notice how we already have a fair bit of boilerplate in place. So again, this is our list, this is how we call our double function, and this is how we display our result. So we can go ahead and start writing our list double function. Notice some things are a little bit different. C generally does not like us to pass arrays around. Instead, what it does is it gives us a pointer to the first element. So with that in mind, here's how I decided to formulate my strategy. We're going to create a function that doesn't return anything. It's called list double. And since what we want to do is to pass in the list, we'll go ahead and accept a pointer to the list. So this gives us a link to where the list is in the memory. And what we can do is we can jump in there and start changing the values. Notice the number supplied here. I've decided I want to work backwards. I think that's just a little bit easier. In this case, you can simply tell your user that they should enter the size of the list here. But we're going to do something crafty with that number. For us, we won't call it size, we'll call it n. Here's the idea. If the value of n is zero, that's our base case. The list has a length of zero, right? We don't have to do anything. We just return, no more recursion. But if that's not the case, as long as n is greater than zero, then we want to go to our list and we want to change something. For clarity, let's call this list like this instead. So we don't you know, confuse these two variables. I'm going to go to list and I'm going to the item in the n minus 1 position. All I have to do is to multiply that value directly by 2. So what's cool is, again, because we have a pointer to the original list, we can poke right in there and change the value directly. Why do we do n minus 1? Remember, we're telling the user that this is the size. We have an array of 4 items here, there is no position 4. Right, our positions are 0, 1, 2, 3. That's why we do minus 1. So with this done, we can go ahead and call our function recursively. So list double, we give it the same list, but this time we subtract one from n. That's it, that's your recursion. We'll go ahead and compile it, run the code, and you can see the values displayed by this for loop are indeed two, four, six, eight, starting from the original values of one, two, three, four. So what's interesting about this technique is we are back to counting. Or because you have a list, it doesn't mean you have to work with it like a list. You can always inject an additional variable. Key observations. While you may not need an explicit counting variable, the thought process stays the same. Something needs to diminish as we move along the recursion, moving us closer and closer to the base case, eventually meeting its condition. So we're now pretty confident at controlling the steps taken by a recursive function. Let's now turn our attention to the second of the two major challenges, which is how to make our recursive function actually do something to produce the desired results. Going back to Fibonacci numbers, let's all focus on how the answer is being built, as opposed to how the recursive function calls lead into each other. Observe the values returned by each function call. In this case, we're building our answer by summing up what is returned by the two recursive calls we've made. We then return our answer, and our caller will do the same. 
So that's why we need all those recursive calls. All the intermediate answers need to get added together to produce the final result. In this case, we build our answer by adding. Of course, that's far from the only way in which we can do things. Let's say now, you have to reverse a string instead using recursion. What then? Pause the video and think about both the counting aspect, that's challenge 1, as well as how the final result can be reconstructed. In a moment, we'll jump into a trace and explanation. Now this one is really quite interesting. Let's say we take a string like this, it says hello world. If we were to have to break this down step by step to solve it, perhaps here's one way we can approach it. Let's go ahead and swap the first and last letters. That's it, that's all we're going to do in a single computational step. So if we were going to use recursion to approach this, we'll take the rest of the string that is the stuff on the inside, and we're going to pass it along to the next recursive call, which in turn does the same. We now have a substring, but all that function does is again swap the first and last letter. Then we proceed onwards. I'm sure you can imagine how this is going to work out. Each recursive step just needs to do this swapping. Then it needs to narrow down the set of characters so that the next call has less to work with. Eventually, we'll get to the point where we swap the last pair of letters, and that's it, we're done. As you can see, this is an inversion of the original string hello world. It now reads backwards. So there are a lot of interesting things to observe with this strategy. Notice how because each step puts two characters in the right place, then we need to have about half as many steps as there are characters, approximately. Also notice how our string is diminishing as we move along, just like what happens with our list in the previous example. So let's try to do a string reversal. We are back to Python. I think it's just a little bit easier to work with strings and the like here. I'm going to clear my console and let's jump in. Let's write a string reverse function based on any given string using the same method that we've seen previously. In our trace from before, there is one thing that we didn't really have to think much about, and that is whether the string has an odd or even number of characters. Hello world has an even number of characters, so every letter can be swapped with another letter. But if we had an odd number of letters, then there's going to be one left behind. In this implementation, in the interest of getting it to work correctly for any given string, we're going to have to try and take that into account. Therefore, I think the easiest way to do this is to have multiple base cases. Our first base case will work for if it is an even number of characters. So we're going to get to a point where there are no characters left. That's why we say length is zero. In this case, all we have to do is to return an empty string. If, however, this string has an odd number of characters, we will end up with one character left. In which case, we simply return it. If you have an odd number of characters, your middle character stays where it is while everything swaps around it. That's why we do it this way. Finally, we can look at our recursive case. And this is the part where we have that abstraction. We just do what we need to do and the recursion takes care of the rest. Here's how we're going to do it. We'll go ahead and return s minus 1. This in Python terms means the last thing in say a string or a list. So position minus one. If you're using something like Java that doesn't let you do that, you can always say length of s minus one. It means the same thing. Either way, that is the last item. I'm going to take the last item. I'm going to concatenate it to the string itself, but after doing a string reverse recursively. We're not going to give it the entirety of s. Remember, the first and the last characters have been taken care of, so we want to get rid of those. I want to start at position 1, and I want to end before the last item. So again, this is a Python convention, remove the first item, remove the last item. So we are left with what is in between. Finally, concatenate it to S0. S0 means the first thing in the string S. So what's going to happen now is we're going to put the first character all the way at the end, the last character all the way at the beginning, and in the middle, we're going to just call recursion and let the recursive steps do its magic. The answer we're going to get out of this then is hello world in reverse. So get used to this abstraction. Remember, while writing this, we don't really care how this string reversal of the middle stuff actually happens. We just assume that string reversal reverses the string. 
it just works the way it's supposed to without thinking about how it actually achieves this. By the way, since we've seen the difference between an even length string and an odd length string, let's try and do both. Let's try and say hello space world. Now the length is 11, and yet when we run it, it should work just fine. The space staying where it started. So that's how you write a recursive function while also imagining that the recursive function has already been written. Time for the big question again. What are our key observations here? First, notice how we approach the problem by breaking it down into a series of repeating subproblems. The pertinent pattern of note here is how the recursion solves one subproblem, takes it out of the picture, and passes whatever remains onward to the next recursive call. Remember, as we've discussed before, you can assume that the recursive call is magically correct. In other words, assume that the remainder of the problem is somehow automatically solved by that function call. Don't even try to imagine what it needs to do. Just trust in your future self and assume that the function gives you the correct answer as per the design. Okay, what next? Let's take stock of what we have. I've done my own step of processing to produce the correct answer for my own sub-problem. I also have the correct answer to the rest of the problem, courtesy this magical recursive call I've made. So all I need to do is to put these two answers together. In other words, the only problem I need to solve is this. How do I add my correct answer to the rest of the correct answers to create a bigger correct answer? Let's try to apply that to a subtly different problem, a list filtering function. Given a list, filter it down, keeping only the numbers divisible by 3. This problem is slightly different because, as you can imagine, there's going to be a conditional aspect to building up the answer now. And yet, the thought process should stay the same. Pause the video and design your recursion bearing these in mind. What are our sub-problems, how do we treat them, and how can we build the answer? Go ahead, I'll be here to run through the answer with you in a bit. Here is our list. Let's go ahead and write a list filter function. Again, our list filter function takes in a list. And what we can start to think about now is the same two things. How are we going to proceed from state to state, challenge one, and how are we going to construct the answer, challenge two. So the first part should not be very difficult because it's the same idea as what we've been doing up to this point. Take the list, do something to the first item, and then continue onwards. But constructing the list is the interesting part here. So let's begin. As always, if the list is empty, then we don't have to do anything. We'll simply return an empty list. Otherwise, this is our recursive case. What's interesting about our recursive case is that it has its own set of if statements. In fact, there are two conditions here that we need to handle. Firstly, the number is divisible by 3. And secondly, it is not. And both of these need to have an appropriate recursive case. So first, if the first item in our list modulo 3 gives us 0, that's the standard way in which we check for divisibility. That tells us it's divisible and we want it. So we're going to go ahead and return the value itself. Again, we want to wrap it in a list. This is just a Python thing because when we want to join two lists together, they both have to be lists. So we want to return that item. And on top of that, we also want to continue processing everything else. So let's do list filter on the rest of the list. So again, this is list starting from item one and everything else. So we are excluding the first item within the list. So that is the first of two possible recursive cases for when our condition is met. What if our condition wasn't met? Then we would say else. Return. And this time, we do not want to include the item, but we still want to continue the recursion. So all we have to do is to call this. So our two possible choices of constructing an output are as follows. For any given item, we'll decide. If it follows our condition, we'll include it along with the rest of the answers provided by list filter. Again, just imagine that it magically exists and is correct. All we are doing is we're appending our answer to it. But if it does not follow our condition, then we don't have to append our own answer. We'll just take whatever correct answer we have and pass that straight on through without changing it at all. So hopefully you can see the power of thinking that way. 
just imagine that the function is already correct for the rest of the list. So if I were to run this, you get to values 3, 6, 9. Those are the values that are divisible by 3. Values that do not follow our condition simply do not get added to the final result. That's all there is. Good, we have an answer to both of the major challenges in rising recursion and an ironclad strategy to think about each. Now, all that's left is to use it to solve real-world problems. I want to end off with another big example to show off more patterns that may be of interest to you as you step up to bigger problems. For this, I want to show you a real-world algorithm, Merge Sort. Here's a quick explanation of this algorithm. First, we have Merge. If you give it two sorted lists, it'll combine the values inside to create one big list that's still sorted. Let's not worry too much about how that's done, and instead focus on Merge Sort, which takes an unsorted list and recursively performs merging on it to get it all nice and sorted. So let's first see how we can do merge sort just on paper as a trace. The idea is this, we have a list like this, and as our recursion starts to proceed, we will break down that list into half. So that's all that happens as we start to proceed into the recursion. Eventually, we'll end up with a set of singular lists. This is in fact our base case, we do not go further with our recursion. Instead, we start to return, and on the process upwards, that's when we start to call the merge function to bring these sublists back together. Remember, the idea behind merging is given two sorted lists, we'll put them together, we'll combine them into one list while they stay sorted. So let's try it. What's going to happen is between the first two items, they're going to get merged, and in this case, their order is swapped. Same goes for the second set of items. We'll swap their order and put them back in place. For these remaining four items, they do not need to get swapped. They just go back into their original order. So we're one level up. What we can do is again, we'll do the same. These are sorted lists. So what we'll do is based on each list, we'll put together the values in the correct order. The actual algorithm works by starting on the left of each sublist and picking out the smaller of the two until we run out. So let's do that to the two sublists on the left and again to the two on the right. And again, with these two sorted sublists, we can combine them to produce a final sorted list. That's the idea behind merge sort. The key pattern I would like you to observe here is how we do some work while going into the recursion and some more coming back. We are back in Python again, and we already have a merge function written out. Don't worry too much about that, as usual, that is out of scope. What's more important here is our merge sort function. So let's see how we're gonna break things down. As always, we have to start with our base case. Remember, our strategy involves taking an unsorted list breaking it down, sorting each half, and then recombining them. So the only time in which we can't do that is when we already don't have enough items. So if the length of the list is less than or equals to one, so it could be zero items, depending on how things break down, or it could be one item. In that case, it's already sorted. We don't want to break it down any further. We simply return the list. So that's our base case done. Let's now look at the recursive case then. So else, this will be our recursive case. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start to find a midpoint and then chop up the list based on that midpoint. So mid would be the length of the list divided by two. Now, there is a risk of this being a floating point number, a decimal number. So let's force it to an integer so that that does not happen. This allows me to create two lists, which I'm gonna call left and right. Left is the first list, which starts from the very first item and ends at mid. So left is zero up to the midpoint exclusive. Right would be from the midpoint all the way to the end. Turns out when writing the merge sort algorithm, things are even easier to reason about at this point. All we have to do is to run merge sort on both of these lists. Here's the thing, merge sort is supposed to sort a list, right? So we don't care what actually happens. Remember, that's the magic, right? We assume that merge sort is already created. And what that means is if I were to sort the left sublist and the right sublist, I will end up with two sorted lists, ignoring how that actually happens. 
Now all I need to do is to put them together. That is when I actually call merge. So in fact, that gives us the answer which we can return. I simply want to merge left and right. That's it. Left is sorted, right is sorted at this point. So if I merge them together, they will still be sorted. Now this merge function is what we've written above. That is the function that takes two sorted lists and combines them into a list that is still sorted. So here is our code to test this out using the same example. Let's run this. And as you can see, that's the answer. That is merge sort in a nutshell. In fact, it takes more lines of code to implement merge than it does to implement merge sort, thanks to the magic of recursion. Why talk about merge sort? I wanted to use this trace to show you another pattern and strategy you could use in designing recursive solutions. So let's again ask ourselves the important question. What key observations can we make here? What I want you to pay attention to is when work is done. In fact, this happens at two distinct points. First, before the recursion, which I'm going to call going in. As we delve deeper into the recursion, we're breaking down the list into smaller and smaller parts. Then we hit the base case. Up to this point, we've taken the base case to mean that our job is done. But that's not necessarily true. The base case just means we're done with the recursion. But really, as each recursive call returns an answer to its caller, its caller wakes up and has a chance to do something with the results it has received. In other words, reaching base case isn't the end point, it's the halfway point. We're done going in, but we still have to come back and construct the answer as we go along. In fact, when it comes to merge sorts, the heavy lifting is done when coming back. To build the answer from the return values, merge sort runs the expensive merge function to solve the problem. Of course, that's not to say the going in step is pointless. It sets up the data to make the technique work in the first place. Of course, lists of size 1 are inherently sorted, and that's why it's possible to merge them and maintain sortedness. Compare and contrast with the previous example, the filtering one. In that case, we do all our decision making before the recursive call. When the answer comes back, all we're really doing is passing the answer along, adding in the current value if the condition is met. So to summarize, we can do work going in, we can do work coming back, or we could do both. Again, reason about each step of the recursion in isolation, thinking only about solving your singular sub-problem and assuming that the recursive call gives you the correct answer for everything else. Then you can simply ask yourself, what do I need to prepare for that recursive call? Do that work going in before the recursive call. Then ask yourself, after the result comes back, what else do I need to do to get to the correct answer? That's the work you do coming back, after the recursive call. Incidentally, I've heard of these two steps referred to as winding and unwinding. In fact, you probably sound a little cooler saying that, but ultimately, the concepts are the same. Wow, this has been a journey. As we've now seen, recursion is incredibly powerful and allows you to do complex tasks without loops or other complicated variable manipulations. However, it takes some practice to wrap your head around. And hopefully today's video serves to formalize some of the thought processes you would use to reason about recursion. Don't forget your two major challenges. Firstly, charting a path for the recursion. There needs to be something that changes over time, working its way towards the base case. Then there needs to be work done. Break everything down into sub-problems and solve just one, passing the rest to a future recursive call. Don't forget, work can be done both before and after the recursive step. The unfortunate thing about recursion is that you're not going to be able to see the full picture at once, and you have to accept the discomfort of that. Remember, assume that the next step is magically correct, so in implementing your function, just focus on doing one unit of work, setting things up for the next, and passing the work on. And that's it for today's video. I hope I've given you a framework with which you can reason about recursion, and to give you a confidence boost when it comes to using it to solving problems. Thank you very much for watching. You're watching 0612 TV with nerdfirst.net. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video and are feeling generous, a donation to this channel will be greatly appreciated. There's a link on screen and in the video description for more details. Meanwhile, please do like, comment, and subscribe. This helps the channel tremendously and gives me the means to do more. Thank you once again, and I'll see you next time.